But it's good to be here tonight. Um, as I was, I started then stopped because I knew other folks were coming in as we always do. Um, God has really put this on my heart because uh, he was showing me some things that's happening globally, but also locally and with individual folk. And what God is wanting each of us to know in our walk, we're going to stumble at times. But as we talked about before, we push our way through, we get back up, we be still to learn why we fell, allow God to show us. And then we keep moving forward. Many of us have done that, but there are some people who have fallen and they haven't gotten up. And they feel like there's no hope for them. They feel condemned. And what God is showing me and showing other folks is that there is no condemnation to those who, who come to Christ. Give him their heart. But what the enemy wants people to do. And tonight I'm also going to be talking to people who are not here. What they want you to do, those of you who are listening, you feel like all hope is lost. You're paralyzed in the issue, the thing that made you fall. Well, you're paralyzed. Guess what? You can't move forward and do any work for God because you feel like you failed him. He sent Jesus his son, to pay the price. He did that. All we have to do is see Jesus, accept Jesus into our hearts. So tonight, I want to focus on the message titled, Regaining Our Footing After a Hard Fall. How many of you have fallen hard before in your life? <laughs> we all raise our hand. And those of you who are listening, uh, you can pretty much relate. When we fall hard, it's, it's, it doesn't feel good. Uh, and some people are still there in the fall. They feel like, you know, they profess to be a Christian and then they fell. Oh, God, I can't do it no more. But there is only one accuser. Who is that accuser, folks? Satan. So if you're being accused through people... Because of our past, constantly, as they forget about your now and how you're living right now, they keep throwing those things in our faces. Well, you were once this, and you were once that, and you did this, and you did that. And they don't look at your now, like how you're walking now. They're being led by spiritual wickedness. There's only one accuser who then manipulates others to accuse you through their self-righteousness, through their self-righteousness, <laughs> through their pride. Pride is evil. It doesn't come from God. They think they're holier than thou. So we're going to go into scripture tonight, and we're going to first start at Luke 7, verses 36 through 39. Those of you listening, Luke 7 verses 36 through 39 and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It's my grandmother's Bible. She probably never thought, well, that I would actually have her Bible as a pastor. She never got to see me except my calling. So this is about oh, Luke 7, 36 through 39. And this is uh, to set it up, a woman anoints the feet of Jesus. And this is a wonderful display of humility, a wonderful display of service. And let me just read here. Then one of the Pharisees asked him, talking about Jesus, to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant, fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. 
Now, when the Pharisee who had, been invi- who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Jesus delighted in the fact that this woman did what she did. And the Pharisee, not realizing that he was a sinner, was quick to point out that she was a sinner. The power in this particular scripture rests with the individual, the woman, who was very tearful, knowing that she was in the presence of greatness. Tearful. As the tears dripped onto him, wiping them off with her hair, at the lowest of the low, Wiping and putting oil on his feet. She knew she was a sinner. She was really free. But the Pharisee didn't think he was a sinner. And he was like, if he only knew what manner of woman this is. See, the Pharisees, and we have some modern day Pharisees, want to keep you in a box. Over your head where you never grow. Holding your past over you. You're a sinner. The first time somebody comes to you and says you're a sinner. Say yeah you are too. But I'm not tripping over the same stuff. You chose to trip over the same stuff over and over again. You're deliberate about your sin. I'm tripping up from time to time. Over different stuff. But hopefully I'm not doing the same thing. Okay. (laughs) That's right buddy. And the Pharisee, in this instance, totally overlooked the humility of the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with the fragrant oil, crying as she did it because, quite frankly, she knew she wasn't worthy to touch him. Jesus, on the other hand, had compassion for her That she was able to touch him. It was the ultimate act of service to fellow man and compassion to fellow man. So I say this tonight. That woman in that instance regained her footing. Saw the the compassion that she received from Jesus. Knew that she could walk away. And I guarantee you, when she touched him, she was changed. I would venture to say because she had heard about him. That's why she came. She already believed in her heart who he is. And so I say this tonight to each one of us. Don't let any modern day Pharisee. And they come in all shapes and sizes and colors and whatever. Hold your past over your head. Especially when your now looks totally different from your past. This is an example. Tonight we're going to regain our footing as we move forward for the Lord. Let's turn to Luke 18. I'll give you some examples. 9 to 14. Luke 18 verses 9 through 14. And I, we, we watched the movie, All of Us, The Son of God, and we saw it played out on the big screen, and I thought it was done wonderfully. And um, just the way uh, it was played out, they were pretty accurate in this particular instance. This has to do with the Pharisee and the tax collector. And we're going to go through three, scripture, three sections of Scripture tonight, and we're going to identify a couple of things that are consistent in the Scripture. Uh, the humility, the understanding that I'm a sinner, And who wins when they recognize who they are. Okay. So let us read here. Luke 18. Verses 9. Through 14. And let me find it here. This is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. As you may know Jesus used a lot of. Parables to explain to us certain things. And this was one of those instances where God, through his son, is making a point about the state of humanity. Tax collectors were reviled. 
They were the lowest of the low. They were scum because of the things that they did to collect taxes. And so those who looked on the tax collector could not stand them, could not do anything. I mean, they didn't like them. So we're setting this up. So Jesus talks. Well, you still don't like tax collectors. <laughs> Jazz, you get a good shot of me right here. And I'm going to suck my gut in a little bit. All right. Uh, uh, okay. So anyway, so Jesus spoke. He said, also, he spake this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. We're going along that same theme. You know, there are some modern day Pharisees who think they got it all together. And, you know, they just jacked something up just a few days ago and they're about to do it again deliberately. But yet they're holding stuff over your head. Right. OK. So let's see what Jesus says about the matter. He says two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed. Thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. Can you see him? Lord, first of all, he's not even, he's like, Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like them. And I know you're pleased with me. What? The epitome of pride, folks. I'm just telling you. So let's keep going. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Listen, he may do this, folks. How many times in church on Sundays? I don't talk a whole lot about giving. And I tell folks, your giving doesn't save you. It's the heart change that saves you. That's why By God Inspired doesn't spend every waking moment trying to we know it takes resources to operate and do what we do here and the materials and things that we may have from time to time. But if your heart is changed and you're walking with God, he will prompt you to do whatever it is you want to do. I don't have to beat it into your head to do that because God loves a cheerful giver. That means and here's the thing, folks, a cheerful giver is someone who has a heart change and is desiring what God is desiring. And is willing to do whatever God tells him to do, whether that's giving to the church facility or the fellowship to be able to operate. Or if God prompts you to give to that homeless person right there without even questioning why he's telling you to give. You're doing it because your heart has changed for him. Let's keep going. So he says. And a tax collector, verse 13, standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to the house, talking about the father's house, justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be abased. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. A base means you will be humbled. Don't exalt yourself. Don't think you're better than anyone. Because the truth of the matter is we're not better than anyone. We're all sinners saved by grace for those of us who believe and have taken the step towards him on that narrow road. Okay. And in this instance... He's telling us, no matter how good your works might be, it's never good enough. The tax collector, on the one hand, recognized he's a sinner and didn't even look to heaven because he knew he wasn't worthy. And yet heaven heard from the tax collector. The Pharisee who knew the law. Beat his chest and I'm this and I'm that. I tithe. I do all this stuff and even was bold enough to look to heaven. God, I know you're pleased with me. Who do you think God heard? He heard the tax collector. 
In this instance, just like the woman with the alabaster's oil, the tax collector and the woman both recognized they were sinners. Both of them profoundly sorry for what they had done. Very tearful. Tears are really an outward manifestation of what's brewing on the inside. Okay? And God heard from both our God heard both of their, their cries and their prayers. I don't know if the woman ever prayed to God, but I'm pretty sure being in the state of mind that she was, she looked for some relief and deliverance. Okay? Two people, two different situations. Jesus told us with the tax collector who God heard. Second time with the lady. And he allowed the lady, the sinner, to touch his feet. Don't ever allow anybody to hold anything over you. You keep moving forward, walking with God. Not tripping over the same thing. Okay? There are many folks who may not know my walk right now who knew me from 30 years ago. And all they have in their memory is Vince, the 13-year-old. 13-year-old who didn't know anything. Made a lot of mistakes. Reese, I made mistakes at 12 and 13 years old that I'm not proud of. So they, those who don't know where I am today, if they came to see me today, they would know something's different, but in their minds, that's the guy that did this or that at 12 and 13. They, their frame of reference and their way for processing who we might be right now is based off of the, 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 the things that they have in their minds about who they think we are. Okay? Let's keep going because we've got a lot to cover tonight. Let's go to John, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 11. John, the 8th chapter. Verses 1 through 11. John, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 11. And this is dealing with Jesus and, and the Pharisees. Let's just read. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. But early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. <laughs> but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go, and this is critical, and sin no more. Jesus is showing us, no matter what it is, that we don't have the ability to throw a stone at anybody. OK. But he's the only one that could have thrown the stone. Because he was righteous, is righteous. And I would venture to say that he probably picked up the stone. 
to, to let them know that the law still stands, because he, he said in the New Testament that not one word of the law would be erased. I am the fulfillment of the law. A lot of people get into this debate about, well, in the scriptures, it said in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, or a tooth for a tooth. I know you didn't say that, but the tooth for the tooth. Or whatever, right? The penalty for the sin still exists. But the people who were rendering the judgment were not capable of because they were sinners too. He would be the one to render the verdict. Okay? So, there are many people today who say, well, we're covered by grace. That, that stuff in the Old Testament... It really doesn't apply. It doesn't apply to you if you see Jesus and you're walking with Jesus. Then you overcome the law because the law is written in your heart. Right? But if you're, the law, if it's not written in your heart and you do what you want to do and you still find yourself doing the stuff, you will be measured by the law. Because those who don't see Jesus and live the way Jesus showed us to live are condemned by the law. Does that make sense? Any questions? I don't want to just be a professor up here pontificating. I want you to ask questions as you're And Let me tell you something. The only stupid question is the question you don't ask. Okay? There's no stupid question. What Jesus is saying to us in all three instances... Don't allow another human being to hold over your head your past mistakes. Don't you be so feeling of so condemned, you're so condemned and you feel like you can't move, you're paralyzed and whatever, that you can't move forward and do some good for God. Now, he's also saying something to us too. When we walk with him, there's, there has to be something very different about our walk. He told the lady here to go and sin no more. Now, reality is Jesus knew she's a sinner and will likely continue to sin. But his hope and his prayer is that she doesn't sin over the things that she was about to be stoned for. Because in the law, she was guilty. Receiving the type of compassion from Jesus, understanding who he is, that moment should have changed her life as she moved forward. In that moment when they were attacking her or about to attack her and stone her, can you imagine the despair that she had? Do you think she had a hope in the future? Nah, she knew by the law she was condemned. I can't, you know, the ne what's the next hour going to hold for this lady? Death. But yet Jesus gave her a pass and said sin no more. I would venture to say, if you can get into this lady's mindset, or it could have been a man, it could have been it. I mean, here is scripture, so I'm going to be heretical. But put yourself in a situation where you were caught doing something, whatever it was, stealing, cussing out your mother, father, whatever is not pleasing to God. And you were about to get that butt whooping. You didn't feel like there was a hope in the future for you when dad or mama was about to get a hold of you. Right? But yet yeah, Jesus stepped in and said, no, we got this. I got this. Sin no more. You can go. And so for the person who is paralyzed in their hopelessness because of a fall, what God is saying to us today, get up. If you're sorrowful and you're like you have despair because of what you've done, that's a good place to be because that's a repentant heart. And he's saying, 
Get up and keep going now. Do things for me. Go and sin no more. A person who gets to this place, one, with humility, because, you know, when you're walking high and you're condemning everybody else, and all of a sudden something, something gets you, you stumble over that thing you were not looking at. You had already mastered this other stuff, like, I'm not going to do that anymore. Oh, no, that's not going to get me. I'm good. I'm a 100% warrior for Jesus. I got it. Start getting prideful. The minute you get prideful is the minute you fall over something you weren't even looking at. So God is saying to each of us, be humble, get up, keep moving, watch and pray. Now, there's a reason why he is telling us to do this. And I want you to turn with me to John 8. We're going to go, well, we're already there, 12. We're going to read 12 through 59. This is a lot of scripture tonight. When you're walking with Jesus, you're growing in spiritual maturity. Let's say, for instance, you don't have a lot of patience, right? And you know it. And you say, God, I recognize I don't have patience. Please give me more patience. How do you think he's going to do that? By testing your patience. See, God, <laughs> it's a strength and conditioning piece, folks. So if you're asking God to give you more patience, then he is going to give you more patience by testing your patience. Whatever you ask God for, Lord, you know, um, I need more money to pay my bills. He's going to test you around that, too. By having you work with what you have, seeing the error maybe of our ways around spending habits as we made our wants our needs and we were not able to take care of our needs because of our wants. So when he rocks our foundation around that, a mind, a renewing of the mind around that area, you begin to say, oh, my God, the reason I don't have what I need is because of me. That's a humbling thing, folks. And then he begins to write that ship through your renewing of your mind. And you're able to say, oh, man, I don't need this stuff anymore. This stuff, I, I wanted that 70. I still want that TV. I want this. <laughs> but the point is, I found in my own personal walk, and I know folks look at outside stuff. You know, Vince, you drive this type of car, you have this type of house, whatever. Rhonda will tell you I'm the cheapest of the cheap. Frugal. When I realized what I had and began to do more things for him and change the way I spent early on, I had more money and Rhonda doesn't even work anymore. Even though she wants to work, but she doesn't work right now. So our income went down in the house, but we still were able to do the things that we needed to do. All with the shifting of how we go about spending our money. That's what God does. So when we ask God for things, be prepared to be worked out. Okay? Now there's a reason why God is changing and moving us into a direction. It's a strength and conditioning piece. The more we grow, and it's all about spiritual maturity. Would you not agree? Spiritual maturity, you're able to hear from God more, and you're not you're not as bothered by things that used to bother you. That means you've gotten stronger and you've become wiser. So when you're walking with God and you're hearing from God and you're growing in wisdom, at some point for some of you, the maturity is going to happen so quickly. And it's, you know, I mean, in an instant, you, you, oh, you, you get it at that instant. Because I told you, self-examination with his eyes constantly is the way to spiritual maturity. Recognizing, okay, I shouldn't have said that. I might have been right but I shouldn't have said it that way. And when you begin to recognize it, he grows you. Boom. Okay, you passed that test. You shouldn't do that anymore. Okay, there's some tests I'm probably failing right now that I should. Uh, my wife will let me know sometimes. <laughs> but, but the point of the matter is we, he wants us to see some things. So here's where we're going to go. We're going to talk about the, the first coming of Jesus, which is right before our eyes, this, and what the Pharisees missed. Why did they miss who Jesus is? 
because they saw themselves a certain way. And they couldn't see Jesus for who he is. They saw themselves as high and mighty and perfect. And they were far from it. So they could not identify with Jesus, nor could they understand what God was putting right before them because of their mindset around who they thought they were. But when you're transformed from the inside out, you're able to know who he is. You know what to look for. I would venture to say when you look at the woman who had the fragrant oil or the tax collector in the parable, they would understand who Jesus is and the compassion that he had for them. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I got other people listening, so I, they need to hear. Was part of it because they was caught up in the law? Mm-hmm. The law handed down by Moses, that was, supposed to, that was supposed to be the school teacher. But it didn't, it wasn't able to teach, and they became more corrupt. And the true teacher came on the scene. The law manifested in Jesus Christ. They were caught up in the... Regulations. You got something you want to say? Go ahead. Well, it's just um, some. Um, I remember uh, you going back and saying um, that you were uh, the mindset of a person to where you were saying something about um, a person uh, could think a certain way and expect everybody else to think the way they think. Mm -hmm. And since the way they thought about themselves was so high. It was just a belief of mine. I believe they was looking for Jesus to come. You know, I believe they were looking for the Messiah to come the way that they were. Exactly. You know, because they felt so high and mighty about themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, they're just, a, you know, it's something I believe. That, oh, you're absolutely right. Roy, you have something you want to say? No, I, I was just on the same thing what you were saying about how they always told Jesus, well, you know, Abraham, I mean, not Abraham, but uh, Moses said this in the law, why are you, you know, they, they was always hooked up on what the law had to say mm -hmm. outside, and it's like, are you greater than what he said? So, yes, they was always imaging themselves after the law. Mm -hmm. I, I, you're absolutely right. They were caught up in, in the fact that they were caught up in their culture. They were caught up in knowing that Father Abraham was a man of God, had done some wonderful things and but they didn't they saw father abraham for who he was but they didn't do what father abraham did to get to where he was if that makes sense to you all so walking with jesus is going to get us to understand some things so let's go back and look at what the pharisees missed because of how they thought about themselves then we're going to go into the second coming. So in one instance, each of us need to be at a place to not hold ourselves any higher than anybody. To be humble, meek, kind, gentle. If we can do that and have a relationship with Jesus in our walk, where we're constantly worshiping in our thoughts, in our actions, and so forth, then we'll be able to know the signs see what's going on today and be able to understand what God is saying to humanity today. So let's just, I'm going to have someone read um, John 8 verses 12 through 59. Who would like to read and I will hand them this mic so our folks, Reese, would you like to do it? Yes, sir. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Testing. It's on. Go Testing. Ahead. Okay. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. Stop right there for just a second. <coughs> Once you are transformed and renewed, you should know who you are and whose you are. Okay? Jesus already knew who he is and whose he is, the Father's. So when you're walking with that kind of confidence, someone will say to you, buddy, oh, no, you're not, buddy. No, you're not. You know your buddy. 
you know your, your Glenn, all right, Glenn Wilson, or someone says to you, Michelle, Michelle, you're not a beautician. You don't know what you're doing. But every day you show up and do what you do. <laughs> or you know the training you got, the certifications. Jesus didn't need a worldly certification. But what, the point I'm trying to make is you have to know who you are on this walk right now. Keep going, Reese. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Stop there for a second. You judge me by the flesh. In other words, the flesh is wicked. And it dies. But the spirit lasts forever. Okay, the soul, depending on where you're going, if you're going somewhere else, it dies. But if you're living with Christ, you live. The point that he's making is, you don't even understand, Pharisees, what's really going on. You're not even in the game. You don't, you're supposed to know, Pharisees, you have the law in front of you. And you can't even see it. We're not even talking in the same arena. Keep going, Reese. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, Therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself, since he says... Where I'm going, you cannot come. Stop there for a second. <laughs> He's already telling them, folks, where I'm going, you can't go. I'm going to glory. <laughs> He's already telling them, folks, if y'all don't get it right, you're not going where I'm going. How many people do you know today are like Pharisees? How many people do you know who have left the church or the, the assembly of believers, the fellowship, because of Pharisees in the fellowship. This is what this is about, folks. We are called, at least I know the vision he's given me, is to reach those folks who have been, who just, they're done with the church, per se, the Pharisees. Keep going, Reese. Okay. Um, he said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that, I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I will always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are the offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Stop there for a second. I don't have to elaborate any more on what Jesus is saying. Do you all understand what he's saying? Honestly, do you understand what he's saying? That's a, I'm so happy you do. If you understand it, you're on the right path. 
Keep going, Reese. Okay. You are of, they answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You were doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Stop there. Just a second. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> On one hand, you have a people who are boasting in the fact that they're descendants of Abraham. But yet they don't even recognize Jesus in the flesh, nor are they doing the works of Abraham. You remember I talked about the down, down line of, 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 of people, that it's very important for each of us in our now to pass on to our descendants the, the, the rock, the foundation for their lives. But something happened along the way where everything Abraham did and, and passed on got filtered and, and twisted and so forth to the point that they didn't even recognize Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah, they became prideful and into the mess that they were. That's right. More of the law than hearing from God. Okay. It's almost like what you talk about a lot, Pastor B, you talk about their religiosity in mm -hmm. the church. Mm -hmm. They were suffering from the same thing. It was all about the pomp, the circumstance, who we are, our place, the way things should be, the mm -hmm. ceremony. Mm -hmm. So that when the law was right there in front of them, being fulfilled, they didn't see it. Because they were so caught up into order, our regulations that had nothing really to do with the law that was handed down by Moses. Things that they created, the, the traditions. What does that sound like today? Well, Some of our church. Churches. Hold it to her so they can hear. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just I mean, a lot of people feel like just because they go to church every Sunday that they're saved, mm -hmm. but that's not true. Or if they are in the choir, or if they're on the in uh, on the deacon board, mm -hmm. I mean, these things. I mean, those are work, like you said. That doesn't save you. That's right. Let me tell you what Abraham had that the Pharisees did not have, and it's only one thing. Not only the faith, but a heart for God. It's the, remember I talk a lot about heart change, Thomas, and so forth? I talk about a heart change where you no longer desire the things you used to desire, but you desire what, what God wants for, for, for humanity, which makes it so easy to love a neighbor, which makes it so easy to love him. And when you see your neighbor in unrighteousness, you have compassion because you recognize that they're not there yet. What Abraham had and all of the things that Abraham went through, he did it out of a love for God. He left a, a land he was familiar with on a word. Go, Abraham. He was willing to sacrifice his son, even though it was hard to his flesh, because he loved God more than his the Pharisees would not sacrifice their families. They didn't have a heart for God. So if the, script, the scripture says here, if you belong to God, you understand God. You can discern his language. But if you don't have a heart for God, how in the world will you be able to understand that the word is right in front of you through Jesus Christ? Hold on for a second. Hold that thought. 
I like that too, Vince, because uh, even as you're speaking, and I see too, um, and realizing too, is having that heart for God is that even when a point of the enemy going to bring things to your mind, but that don't mean you acted upon them. And having a heart for God is, even though it, it doesn't make you bad, like, okay, that thought came, because that's what his thing is, to bring something to you in your past or bring something to you that may can go contrary to what God wants you doing. But the heart for God would be like, that thought came, but that's not from you, Lord. That's right. And I keep moving this way. That's right. And a lot of times people just think they got the thought and they thought they, I did something wrong. The enemy brings thoughts or he'll bring a, a Put the situation around that you can fall to or fail to, but that one that has the heart of God, you just recognize that, Lord, you're not in it. And you don't feel condemned that you've had the thought because the thought didn't come from you in the first that's place. Right. So that's what having a heart for God is, being able to recognize the enemy, even when he put a thought there that's unrighteous or thought that's something outside, way far-fetched out of God's way, and you being able to recognize and say, Lord, I, that's not you. Mm-hmm. That's a powerful place to be. I always like to say a powerful place to be is when you're in Christ Jesus. A heart for God. How do you get it? We'll talk about that at the end. So those who had a heart for God, but didn't even know a lot about the laws, you know, the Gentiles, but they they were seeking something greater in their own lives. They were able to recognize Jesus without even knowing the law. I, I have a question. Yes. The Pharisees, the ones who actually felt like they were saved because they were doing the law and didn't recognize that that was the son of God. Mm. And they, like he said, you're not serving God. You're serving the devil mm. because you're doing the work, but you're, you don't have the heart for God. How did they get so conflicted, confused that way, though? Over many generations, Rose, it goes way. What he's shown me, and he's taken me back many years, thousands of years. When you begin to understand that this battle is not in the moment, but it's generational. Mm-hmm. That the enemy sets traps for people. Long, he set traps for your ancestors long before you arrived on the scene. And if ancestors fail to it, it would change the trajectory of that downline. See, he's been here since the beginning of time. So his tricks are the exact same. You know, the word of God says that there is nothing uh, new, all right, that the enemy has done, you know. Well, because we have such a short lifespan, Rose, and if we're so selfish, all we're going to see is what I need for me now, what I can get. And we don't understand that whatever we do that is not lined up with God will have an impact on our downline. See, I used to say, and I still say it, the greatest threat, Stephanie, to ourselves is when we cannot see beyond ourselves. That's it. When you can see beyond yourself, then you will understand that you're here for other people, not yourself, and then there are other people who are here for you. Give the mic to her real quick, and I have you finish reading scripture. I think that a lot of older people think that they're, because they've gotten old, that they're really righteous and they're going to heaven, but their heart didn't change. They just told you what they thought was right, which hasn't always been right. That's their it. heart didn't change, and since they've gotten older, they just keep installing it generation after generation like you just say the enemy knows that if i can get you to pass down something as a truth that's not lined up with the word but yet you still believe it whether it's steeped in tradition or whatever then it's going to mess everybody up the game so here's how we stop it seek his truth in his word not what i'm saying but what he's saying Study it for yourself. Ask for revelation. You don't understand. Pastor V will give you, give you, and help you get an understanding. All right. Um, each human being on this planet will come to a place, a fork in the road, where the truth of the gospel is presented to them, and it doesn't line up with the foundation of their life and and who they become. And they have a choice to make. Do I hold on 
to the lie that I made as my truth because I'm loyal to my dad or my grandmother who may not have gotten it right? Or do I recognize the word of God that I said I always believed in and go this way, which would rock my foundation, change me, kind of nullify a lot of stuff that I've done thinking I was righteous Strength is your ability to recognize who you really are and to surrender to God and let him direct your path. Keep going, Brother Reese. Okay. You remember where you were? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. <laughs> it is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. And if I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Folks, <laughs> I don't have to even explain to you this, because if I do, then there are some things perhaps you got to work out in your heart. But they kept harping on things they could see. You're only... That's it. They were leaning on that understanding that Solomon told them not to lean on. All right? And when you think about it, you ever had a conversation with somebody, Kenyana, in your field? So let's say I come to you and you're an engineer, right? I've never studied engineering, didn't get a degree, I'm a journalist. But I try to have a conversation in your arena like I know how to be an engineer. Prideful, yet I don't have a clue. They were trying to stand toe to toe with Jesus, but they weren't even in the same league. But they were too prideful to even realize that they weren't in the same league. Jesus had done all these things, all of these miracles, things that the prophets said would happen. But yet they didn't see it. Why? Because at that point, they really didn't have a heart for the true and living God. They had a heart for God, but it was a lowercase God, the lowercase G. Satan. And he said it. You don't do what you're supposed to do because you serve your, your father, the author of lies. We don't need to be at this place in our lives. Okay? So there are things that many of us have been taught. That for a while we made our truth. But the spirit of the living God, his Holy Spirit, showed us something different. And the things that we were taught by people we loved and loved us. When the word of God was presented to us in a way that was understandable from, a, from people who were humble, meek, recognizing that they were sinners, trying to walk the right way. There was something very different. And then the truth was presented and the person came to a place to say, you know what, I'm going to trust this. I, I'm not dishonoring my mom. I'm not dishonoring my grandfather or my grandmother or whoever. I just realized that just like I'm a sinner, they were sinners. And just like I may not get everything right as I try, I have to recognize that they didn't get everything right. Okay? But what many people don't understand is when you 
look at your parents, depending on the situation you might have had, or your grandparents, when they're dead and gone, we, ho we hold them as angelic, don't we? Oh, mama was this, or daddy was that, or grandpa was this, great grandpa. We forget about all of the hell they cause <laughs> and just look at the good stuff, right? And then we're, we condition our minds over time to have this angelic view of the person that we love so dearly. And then we continue in the same lies that led them. And what God is saying is I'm trying to set the captives free and heal the brokenhearted. So I want to ask you, I don't know what time it is. Oh, gosh. All right, folks, I know we've been gone for 55 minutes. I got to get this last piece in. Is that OK? You OK? You OK, Thomas? Really? OK. OK. Um, let Annie know I'm just going to take about five or ten more minutes. Let's just go to Luke 21. Verses 8 through 28. Luke 21, verses 8 through 28. And Reese, if you don't mind, I'm going to have you read it. I like the way you read. This is about the second coming of Christ, folks. Now listen. We've already talked about what it takes to align ourselves with God. We saw three examples. Jesus showed us one with the tax collector and the Pharisee. Then we saw the lady who anointed his feet with oil. And then we saw the lady who was about to be stoned. And in each circumstance, both, all people had a genuine sorrow for their actions. And so what happens with people like this is they're able to move forward. They're able to regain their footing on solid ground, the solid foundation, as they're able to read scripture and then understand exactly what the Pharisees meant. However, a person who doesn't recognize their issues will not understand God's word. Okay? So as we go into this, this is the second coming. These are the things to look for. Keep reading. Okay. And he said, see that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am he. And the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. For these things must first take place. But the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. Stop there for just one second. <coughs> Don't be consumed, he's saying. There's going to come a time, and there may be times now where you have to, you know, you don't compromise what you believe to make somebody else comfortable, all right? Believe in him. Stay firm in it. And there will come a time when you will be brought before officials and authorities and family members and so forth, whatever it might be. Don't spend a lot of time being consumed about what you're going to say. Allow the Holy Spirit, which is real, he's real, to give you what to say. And what he gives you, no one can resist it because it is the truth. The way Jesus dealt with those folks who were always trying to trip him up, you remember? You know, and he thought about it. You remember the scripture says to be quick to listen and slow to speak. There's a lot of reasons for that. One, if you're quick to listen and slow to speak, you're able to allow God to download into you what to say or what not to say. The flesh will want to react immediately, but you've got to be strong enough not to react. Amen. Okay? And the only way you're strong is if you're in him. Keep going, Reese. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out of the country enter it. 
for these days, excuse me, for these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles <clears throat> until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with the foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will, be, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Thank you. And he oh, told... Uh, that's, 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 that's it. We're going to Andrew 28. I'm going to stop there. Pay attention to the Middle East and Jerusalem. Okay? Israel. The nation of Israel. Um, Gentiles are those who are not Jews. Okay? That's, if you're not of Jewish lineage, you're Gentile. There's going to come a time when... Jerusalem is going to be surrounded. And it's already really surrounded. Um, and there's been a lot of aggression. And it's going to ramp up even more. One of the things that he did say about not losing your hair. That is, that, what I've come to understand is that's about having a peace in the midst of the chaos. You know, when you're stressed out, a lot of things happen to our bodies. We lose our hair. You know, I lost my hair when I was 18, 19, stressing. It was really genetic. But, but what he's saying to us is that when you see these things happen, and they're already happening, okay, don't get anxious or worried. Rejoice. Because these things have to come to pass. And the reason you're able to see them and understand them is because you have a heart for God. You're able to look beneath the surface, not paying attention to the fact that gas prices are low. Ooh, let me go and um, do some road trips. It's okay to do road trips, but don't get consumed by the road trips. Pay attention to what's really going on, and it has more to do. It has more to do with other. There's more to do with it other than just somebody's lowering the prices to drive somebody else out of business. This is all part of the love of money, which is what? Love is the root of all evil. These type of things are going to come to pass to distract people. So if you're distracted with your road trip because gas prices are low, you're not paying attention to the word of God that says that these type of things, there's going to be things that are going to be happening after all of this. Okay? Around the world. So you've got to think globally. You've got to look globally. Not just in, you know, it might not be snowing in my neighborhood but it doesn't mean it's not snowing in New York. Does that make sense to you? So the things that the word of God talks about coming to pass, you may not see it at the Holiday Inn, but it might be happening in Istanbul or Paris. But if you're so insular, or you, you, all you look at is about around your area, You'll miss everything that's happening globally. Okay, any other questions? What do we say tonight? Humility. Understanding that we're sinners saved by grace, which means that we are to sin no more, which means that we are to move forward, not stumbling over the same thing that we stumbled over before. As we move forward with a heart for God through his son, Jesus Christ, we're able to understand the word of God, understand what the Pharisees missed, not being prideful about what we understand, remaining humble so that we're able to understand what's happening right now. To God be the glory.